Okay, welcome. So you are all turned into, tuned in to Learn with a Naturalist video showcase exploration. And this is gonna be led today by our own education manager, Suzanne DeCourcy. Give a wave, Suzanne. <laughs> Uh, my name is Carrie Winninger, and I am the outreach lead for Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry. And I have to give all of you a special thank you because this is our last virtual event for the season. So thank you for being here. It has been an incredible journey this spring, adapting to this virtual space because usually we have all of our programs in person, right? Either at the Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain in Pengrove or at the Galbraith Preserve near Yorkville in Mendocino. So the shelter in place is just, we're really looking for all the opportunities it's brought. And we've been really happy to be able to form connections in just a very different way. Um, and thank you all for being part of this community. Hi, good to see you again, Anna. <laughs> All right, so before I let Suzanne take it away, I'm gonna tell you about what the Center for Environmental Inquiry is and how we can be a resource to you, no matter if you're affiliated with SSU or not. So you can be a student or parent, a government employee, an educator, member of the public, or maybe you work with an organization that's in need of environmental solutions, which is what we specify in. Well, the center envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions, and it invites you to get environmentally ready with us. We actually have several people wearing our environmentally ready shirts today, if you wanna show those off. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is build a community of learners and problem solvers, and that's both at SSU and in the community, across all sectors of society, which is key. We're hoping to do this by providing firsthand understanding of our connection to the environment and skill building experiences that result in these sustainable solutions. So some of those ways we can get you involved are engaging in research with us, which doesn't necessarily have to be scientific research like my most people might think. You can do one of our training programs, which will be highlighted today through our naturalist program, our land management program, and others. Um, our community naturalist program, which is especially for non-students. Uh, there's internships and student jobs. There's events like these that we hold every semester. Uh, we also have data that you can access. You can lead or contribute to events or partner with us on projects, and that's a big part of what we do as well. So the point is, that you all individually are critical in addressing the greatest environmental challenges that humans have ever faced. And so we thank you for being part of that solution. Today, we're gonna hear straight from the folks who spent a lot of their time and energy at these beautiful lands and with our programs. And then Suzanne DeCourcy, our education manager, is gonna kind of be our guide through that. So it's our learn with a naturalist type event. And that means it's a little more relaxed we're gonna see all these wonderful videos. Suzanne's gonna give us some segues about them. And then at the end, we'll have these students available to ask questions. So any of the students here who have videos being shown, can you give a quick wave? Hi. And community. You <laughs> and You're a community, community naturally. <laughs> So any of these people will be available to talk about their videos or about the programs they were involved in in a more general way. Um, now, only after I'm done with this piece, Suzanne's going to take controls and then she'll make her screen shared and then we'll all mute everybody so that it's not distracting. But then at the end, we'll be able to have everybody speaking again and interacting. Um, so for now, the chat box is really the best way to communicate. Let's say you can't hear something or you need to get my attention. Just go ahead and type in the chat box. Uh, and I'm actually going to ask you all to practice really quick uh, because it's really helpful for us to take a roll call um, using the, the chat box. So if you could all just type your full name in the chat right now that would help me know who's here today. I see some people doing that already. Thank you so much. All right, well with that I'm going to mute everybody and I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to see you all and it's wonderful to see um, some familiar faces too. A shout out to our wonderful um, uh, community naturalists uh, John and Ned. Um, and uh, Sarah Reed, who um, actually works with us for our land management uh, training out at Annadale. Um, and of course, our uh, wonderful uh, student naturalists, uh, Peter Forte, uh, Nicolette Michael. Uh, Peter's actually also a land steward, and Nicolette is also our outreach assistant. 
Um, and Aries, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Aries, I, I always have a difficult time with your last name, um, who is uh, one of our uh, community member naturalists who also uh, contributed a video. And uh, as Carrie said, you'll be able to uh, talk to them at the end if you have any questions or just want to hear more about our program. Um, I'm going to try not to talk too much at the beginning um, because I want us to get, you know, get started on the videos, but just to briefly introduce myself for those who don't know me. Uh, my name is, uh, obviously my name is Suzanne Corsi, but uh, what I do at the center is I'm the education manager. And honestly, that means that I get to do some of the most fun things at the center because I get to work uh, with students and community members who participate in our naturalist training program and our land management training program. And uh, Carrie uh, talked about, uh, you know, needing to come together and work toward environmental solutions to become environmentally ready because we are facing a lot of uh, challenges in the future. And so uh, we basically have these training programs that give people those skills. And sometimes they're very specific skills, like how to use a weed wrench, which I'm sure uh, Peter would be happy to talk more about if that piques anyone's uh, curiosity. But um, we also, uh, you know, uh, teach what are sometimes called more foundational skills, like being able to communicate or being able to step up and, and take leadership. Uh, so, um, and then of course, our, our naturalists get to put those skills into practice by leading tours for third through fifth graders or members of the general public uh, on our SSU preserves uh, and our land management uh, students uh, go out throughout Sonoma County and work on an ecological restoration projects. So uh, I basically get to, um, you know, spend time with those wonderful people out on the land or uh, in times like these virtually. So, like I said, wonderful to see, your, see all your faces. Uh, and one of the things that I really enjoy about these programs is it really does bring SSU students and community members together because uh, you know, basically the students and the community members get to spend time out there and sometimes even co-lead tours uh, and uh, get to learn from each other because obviously uh, students get to learn from community members, wonderful life experience and just, you know, general experience. But students also bring enthusiasm and new knowledge. There's always, you know, new knowledge that's coming out even in undergraduate classes that I didn't even learn in graduate school. So um, I love that that combination that we have here. That's one of my favorite things about the center. And um, so before we actually get started on our videos, I do want to just mention uh, everyone remembers kind of how this all started uh, when the pandemic began and we all kind of just tried to figure out technology. So you're seeing uh, you're seeing videos that were shot by uh, people with cell phones and sometimes you'll see the odd finger kind of drift into the frame or, um, you know, it's it's uh, um, kind of a, a little wobbly. Uh, and of course, uh, they were also shot by people who needed to social distance. So, uh, so we're watching these to, to learn from our students and learn from our community members and hear what they have to say and see some, some interesting things. Um, but bear that in mind that these are, you know, this is what, what we were able to do uh, during this time. But I was really excited to see how many people stepped up and actually provided these videos. Um, and uh, they're, uh, you might possibly have some lag issues because, of course, we're providing these videos through a streaming service, but they'll all be posted. So if you would like to go back and see the videos or like, oh, I had a little bit of a lag, I'd like to, to go back and see this one in particular, um, they'll all be posted. Carrie will tell you how you can actually go see them. Uh, and um, you also will, in some of these videos, hear people refer to, as we had just seen in this last video, refer to a larger series. Those will be posted too, so that you can get a fuller picture of, oh, that was interesting. What was that person, you know, seeing before? Uh, or uh, you'll get either access to the whole series, or we'll save, we'll give you information on how to get there yourself. Uh, <clears throat> and finally, as Carrie mentioned, please hold your questions till the end, just because we want to make sure to get uh, all get uh, all the videos, a, you know, a chance to show, and uh, then you'll have a chance to uh, talk to and you know some of the people who who produced the videos or created the videos uh, and uh, we'll hopefully we'll have a, a fun conversation that's kind of engendered engendered by these 
So the very first video I'd like to share with you actually comes from, and, and many of you might know him, he's famous, or as he will say, infamous, um, Jurassic John. And he is actually our longest serving volunteer uh, with the center right now. He's been with us for about 15 years, but as he will tell you, he's seven years old. So uh, that's, that's the way in which he approaches uh, working as a naturalist. And so um, he's a wonderful resource for our student naturalists, for our um, community member naturalists who, who um, you know, have been trained in the last few years. And I am very excited that we actually uh, got him to agree to be filmed because he is, he likes to say he's extremely offline. Um, but this is part of a series that he actually put together for us uh, for our docent training program at the Osborne Preserve. So you'll kind of hear him make reference to things that aren't necessarily applicable to us right now. But he starts the way uh, that he would basically, he basically likes to start with the kids. And I think that it sets a really nice tone uh, for our video showcase. Uh, and so um, I'd like us to enter into uh, that spirit. We'll, you know, we'll um, join um, Jurassic John as he um, kind of gets us into uh, the right frame of mind to watch the rest of these videos or to really have any type of experience in nature. Okay, so at this point, what we're going to do... Sorry about that. Okay. What we're going to do is, I've talked more than I should have before now, but that's all right. For me, the minute you cross that bridge over there, the bridge to the parking lot, you entered a different world as far as I'm concerned. The other world is wonderful, and if you even in the parking lot, you see that there's wonderful things. And there's amazing things throughout Sonoma County. But the preserve itself is magical, very magical. And it's just an amazing place, every step, everywhere you look or hear, or smell, there's amazing things. So with that in mind, I want you to leave all the stress, and these days there's a lot of it for different reasons. Anything that you might be thinking of outside of the preserve, and I mean that, I mean you might be um, disappointed you're not taking a math test today or something, but you need to leave all that behind. Think about the people that can't come out here today, that you get to be here, and what we're going to do is we're going to breathe three times. We're going to close our eyes. We're on a mountain that's growing underneath our feet as we stand here. Okay? We're going to fill the mountain. We're going to use our other senses to hear and to smell, to fill the air. And what we're going to do then is I'm going to tell you to breathe in. You're going to breathe in slowly and hold your breath. Then I will tell you when to breathe out. You'll breathe out just as slowly. And we're going to do that three times. So, everybody, breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Now at this point, hopefully I've helped you arrive a little bit more here, opening up, giving you a little bit more chance just to breathe in better. When in doubt, you can always stop and breathe. And when you're ever going on the trail, if you don't get in a hurry, and I'm not in the best shape to get in a hurry, that uh, you can hear things. One of the best ways of finding anything is you'll hear it first. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look for more critters today. But we're also going to do with activities besides that. So if we're going to go look for things, 
can we go off the trail? Well, we can go off the trail to do activity. I am seven years old. Going off the trail is an activity. Okay, so with that in mind, when we do that, I want you to all be aware of, of, well, let's take a moment and think about what we should be aware of, okay? So hopefully you're all now, so hopefully you're all now feeling more relaxed and taking deep breaths. Um, and you might also have your curiosity peaked because you're wondering what critters Jurassic John's going to find. He's talking about going off the trail and doing more activities. So, like I said, we will send you to where you can see the rest of those videos. You can learn more from Jurassic John. But I, I like the idea of, of starting with that, with kind of putting ourselves uh, in um, the frame of mind to be experienced in the natural world, even if we're doing it through video. Um, and uh, with that, I, I want to introduce our next video. And we're going from one of our longest serving naturalists to one of our newly trained SSU student naturalists. So uh, this is Brianna Bertoli. And um, our uh, student naturalists uh, were able to go through training um, before we ended up going to virtual programs. But um, then a lot of them went back to, uh, you know, where they where they lived with their parents. And so Brianna was um, excited to get out there with her camera and put some of her uh, naturalist knowledge to use in her own neighborhood, which she did. So she actually created two uh, videos, which are somewhat short. So I'm going to go ahead and play them one after the other without um, uh, any uh, introduction in between. So we will see uh, Brianna um, uh, basically sharing some of the uh, naturalist knowledge that she learned when she went through the program this past spring. This right here is a madrone tree and it's called the refrigerator tree because if you touch it, it is extremely cold. We just hiked up a mountain, so it feels really nice right now. Um, and it is this cold because it has a really deep root system that can uptake a lot of water and its vascular system helps transport that throughout the tree. Hence why it's so nice and cold. There's another guy right in here. Another California slender salamander. Let me see if he will let me pick him up. Give that back to you. So here he is. This one's a little bit smaller. They're very lazy. He's not at all bothered. So they like to live under pieces of wood like this over here. It's nice and moist and cool for them. And this is the California slender salamander. You can tell because they're obviously very slender and they have this dark coloring. Can you see him? It's very cute. So I have to agree with Brianna, I think California slender salamanders are very cute. <laughs> um, and uh, I enjoyed um, uh, sharing those videos because I think they demonstrate uh, one of the things that I really like about our program, which is that it's very hands-on and, and naturalists and visitors to the preserve can actually, um, uh, you know, literally learn where to find animals and also how to handle them. Uh, you don't see it in this video, but I do want to mention that uh, you, you know, once once she uh, found that the California slender salamander, she put it right back where she found it, be found it because uh, many of those animals are territorial and you don't want to move them too far and also replaced um, essentially its home, put its home back together. Um, so uh, I um, was really happy to hear from, from uh, Brianna and uh, our next uh, video is actually going to come from another one of our trained naturalists, but also 
a student who uh, has taken advantage of another opportunity that we have at the center, uh, which is basically uh, a paid um, land steward position. So that is Peter Forte. So he was trained as a naturalist, uh, led tours. Um, and the activity that he focuses on in his video is a reminder to really um, immerse, it, it's really helpful to be able to immerse yourself in the natural world. And, uh, you know, we like, I, I am one of those people who loves to know what's this, what's that, you know, I want to learn facts about it. And those are very important. Um, but it's also important to remember that it's actually easier to both experience the natural world and even to learn more about the natural world if you have those periods of reflection. And if you want to learn more about that, I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, we will um, hear from Peter and he's actually here today. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask him, feel free to ask him at the end. Hi, my name is Peter Forte. I'm a land steward for the Center for Environmental Inquiry. Uh, and today I just wanted to talk about um, one of the my favorite activities that I like to do um, during my time as a naturalist uh, for this center. Um, and today we're at the Fair, Fairfield Osmer Preserve um, and we're on the Madrone Trail. Um, and so one of the things that I like to do uh, is called a silent hike and it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's as the name suggests, uh, but basically with when you're with a group, um, you turn to them um, at a certain point, hopefully when it leads to something that you may want to talk about, like like one of the ponds or an open open field or prairie, um, something that you can kind of give them as a, re a reward for their, for their silent hike. Um, but you would want to turn to your group um, and say, hey, this is the part of the um, experience where we're going to be quiet now um, for a few hundred feet um, to try to take in some of the, the things that we don't normally take in um, when we're hiking with people because we're talking and we're socializing. Uh, but this is just a chance to kind of expand um, your awareness um, to your surroundings. Um, that's actually some of the, that's one of the themes of the activities that I like to do is just expanding um, your other sensory um, devices um, so that you can take in a lot more. Um, and so Kyle is going to help me. Um, we're going to do a silent hike for you. Um, and then we're going to come back and kind of talk about how to lead a reflection of that hike. So ideally, um, you'd go a little longer, uh, but that was just to give um, people at home a little bit of a taste. Um, sorry, there's some mosquitoes flying around. A little bit of a taste uh, for what a silent hike can offer. Um, so you'd turn to your group and you'd ask them a series of questions um, about their experience and just ask them, you know, what, what type of things do they hear or pick up? Um, and why do they think it's important um, to do silent hikes? Um, and if maybe they'd want to replicate uh, or uh, replicate that with um, some of their friends or family um, when they're on another hike. So yeah, that's the silent hike. One of my favorite things about that video is is hearing how important it is to be uh, quiet in nature. And it's it's very interesting to hear from some of the, especially the younger visitors to our preserves, uh, like the third through fifth graders um, who we serve with our um, uh, naturalist program. Uh, I hear from a lot of them and, and a lot of the naturalists can, can attest to this, that uh, they say they don't really have uh, the opportunity to be quiet in nature. A lot of them will say, it's the only time I've walked by myself, or it's the only time I've really spent quiet you know, a quiet time in nature without someone kind of micromanaging it. 
Um, so I'm glad that uh, Peter was able to remind us of that. And by the way, if you were wondering who was the mysterious Kyle, we will meet him in a future video. So just you wait. Um, but our next video is not from Kyle yet. That's actually from uh, Nicolette Michael, uh, who is also, uh, you went through uh, our, our naturalist training program, was trained as a land manage uh, management student as well, uh, and also is our outreach assistant, so is also taking advantage of some of the additional opportunities that we have at the Center for Paid Work for Students. Uh, and so, and she's been, she's actually one of our longest serving uh, student volunteers at the center. I, uh, um, I'll have her then chime in uh, maybe at the end with how many years she's actually been with us because it's been, it's been a while. Um, but you might have been looking at these videos and saying, well, this, this is great, but you know, they're all outside and, and especially now, like, what if you're stuck inside? And what I really like about this next video is Nicolette goes through an activity that you can do, uh, whether you're inside or outside. Um, really, you can do it just about anywhere as long as you have some type of natural object to observe. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Nicolette's here today, so if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask her uh, after the, uh, when, when we're at the end of our event. Hello, my name is Nicolette Michael, and I'm a student at Sonoma State studying biology, um, and I work for the Center for Environmental Inquiry as an outreach assistant, and I also did, did the naturalist training. And I wanna, today I'm in my house, and I would like to do a fun activity um, called, I notice, or no, I want, eh. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Um, and I am gonna be looking out my window today. Beautiful window here. Um, so here we go. Um, so the, the, the point of the activity is to sort of expand how you're observing something by using the statements um, that, are, that I um, just said. And the first one would be sort of just observing the, um, all the senses like, um, smell, sight, touch, taste, if applicable, and so on. Um, but today, since we're inside, I'm just gonna open the window here and sort of observe what's going on. Let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna switch this. How do I do that? Okay. okay, so I'm looking at my window and I think I wanna focus on this plant in front of me. Um, so I'm gonna start off, I'm just gonna like observe there's a slight breeze, so I don't I don't know if I can smell much here, but um, I'm just gonna look around and see. Okay, so I think what I'm noticing, so I notice um, that the leaves, most of them are sort of shaped like a um, sort of, they're pointy on the end. Some of them are slightly rounded. That's interesting. Let's see if I can, it's hard to see it here, but it's gotta bleed me. <laughs> um, and, most of the flowers, I think, are pretty red, but then there's some that have a little bit of white to them. That's interesting. And then, let's see. I wonder um, if the leaves smell like anything and if the leaves smell different than the, the flowers. Um, because they feel, and also do they, I wonder if they feel different as well. They sort of, I, I could imagine that the flowers are like small or like feel different. And then, let's see, it reminds me of, let's see, I think those, those flowers remind me of like, like big lips or something, or like upside down Mickey Mouses or something, if you look at it like that. Yeah. So, yeah, the pretty big um, plant. Yeah, that was a little activity I did. Um, and um, if you want to do that activity too, I highly recommend it. It's a fun little thing while you're looking out the window.
So I agree with Nicolette. Um, wonderful activity that you can do. Uh, like I said, just about anywhere. You don't have to actually go outside as long as you have a view um, of, of, you know, outside or you have a natural object. In fact, we've done that inside with um, school groups in the, in the classroom by bringing in, say, something like a skull or a lichen-covered stick, and it works very well. And it's a great way to just kind of um, uh, expand uh, expand what you're actually seeing about an object or, or, or smelling or tasting. Um, now, our next video, I, I promised we would meet the mysterious Kyle, and here he is. Uh, this is Kyle Page. He actually went through the land management training as well and was a former land steward, uh, so he just graduated. Uh, so isn't um, able to uh, continue with us as a student, but uh, he and Peter worked very hard out on the Osborne Preserve, as I'm sure Peter will attest. And they worked very hard on this particular plant that he's going to um, talk to us about. So he is actually going to share another aspect of the natural world, which is basically about an invasive species that he learned about as a land management student and then dealt with um, as a land steward. Uh, yellow star thistle or Centaria solsticialis, um, and um, so you may you may know that uh, invasive species are plants that cause some kind of problem within an ecosystem. And Kyle is going to share about uh, one of the um, most challenging invasive species that we have at SSU's Osborne Preserve. Hi, my name is Kyle Page. I'm a land steward for Incentive. Center for Environmental Inquiry with Sonoma State's Preserves. And I'll be talking about some of the invasive uh, plants that go within the preserve. And one of those is the yellow star thistle. Yellow star thistle is an invasive plant. It is over, it uh, spreads over a lot of different grassland areas within the preserve. Um, now this invasive is, is really bad for the area because it grows very quickly, spreading a lot of seeds coming from different areas. And there's, being a land steward, you, it's really important to understand how to manage these plants and how, what goes on with their growth and how to best manage that growth. So one of the many practices that I've done that I've also learned from the land management training with Sonoma State is how to study it. So one of the many things that I've actually done was doing a uh, plot transect study. So what that means is we basically had a 100 meter line going across the area and then we would take a meter square and for each maybe 10 meters within that line, we'd see the density of yellow star thistle within that area. And getting a density within that area gives you an overall view of what's going on with the area and how dense this plant is. And as you can see, all of all the gray on top of the uh, grassland is the yellow star thistle. So seeing how it's, it's spreading out through the area is really important. And one of the main things is knowing how to mow it or how to manage it and get rid of it because you don't want to be mowing it when it's starting to seed because then you'll be spreading the seeds even more, making the problem much worse. So this could take a while to, fi while to figure out, knowing the exact moment, because there could be a brief window when you can mow this plant. So understanding when to do that can take a really long time. It could take several years because you want to get it exactly right to, under, to get the precise amount of management. So yeah, I, and, uh, yellow star thistle, there's many other types of uh, grassland uh, invasives that go on within this preserve. And this is one of the worst ones. So we can can all be happy that we are here um, at this Zoom event because right now, as we speak, um, one of our um, uh, center uh, uh, employees, um, Ben Bravo, is actually at the Osborne Preserve pulling yellow star thistle. So, <laughs> and Peter is glad right now that he's not doing that because he's going to be doing that tomorrow. Um, but um, moving on to a, a nicer topic than invasive species. I actually would like to um, to play a video from Ari because um, she's a community member naturalist who actually trained with us this winter uh, and uh, has um, provided wonderful help uh, basically producing um, Spanish language materials for the center. 
Uh, and um, we've been just, it's just been wonderful because uh, we now have um, some uh, Spanish language materials for both our Spanish speaking guests and also um, some words, uh, you know, some, some uh, help for uh, our non Spanish speaking naturalists. And uh, in this video, she's focusing on the California poppy in Spanish. Uh, but, um, Ari, for our non Spanish speakers, uh, would you like to share just very briefly a little bit about uh, what you're talking about in this video? And, Carrie, if you wouldn't mind um, unmuting Ari. Yes. Hello, everybody. Well, um, I choose the flower. Well, this is all in the con context of being shelter in place and being home and not knowing what was going to happen. And um, I got this um, request from Suzanne about the video and I was pretty nervous about it. And I, we couldn't go out from our house more, farther than our uh, backyard. And what we had is a California poppy and I'm from Chile. And uh, we know this flower because we have the California poppy in Chile. And I grew up with these flowers, even though they are um, not native from Chile, but um, I know them. And uh, I say, well, this is a wonderful topic to talk about it. And so I present um, the name of the flower in Chile, how we know the, the flower, and it's the Dales de Oro. So it's a golden, what is the thing that you use for sewing, the thing to protect your fingers? What is it called? Like a thing. A thimble? Yes, so it's a golden thimble and um, you can see it in all these areas that are being um, um, intervened, like roads or um, the train tracks and it's really beautiful. So I wanted to share that and it was a way to connect to Chile and also to be part of California. So I hope you like the video. Thank you, Ari. That's beautiful and now we will see the video. Hola, mi nombre es Eri Sawairi, soy voluntaria naturalista de la Reserva de Sonoma State University, Fairfield Osborne Preserve, y hoy día les quiero comentar sobre unas observaciones que podemos hacer um, de estas flores tan bonitas que se llaman um, California Poppy o la amapola de California. Si podemos ver entonces, aquí tenemos um, la amapola de California, podemos observar que son flores de un color muy llamativo, anaranjado y que también tienen cuatro pétalos uno, dos, tres, cuatro otra observación que podemos hacer es el tallo que es bastante fino, muy delgado y largo y podemos ver que las flores nuevas, estos botones son flores nuevas están cubiertas por una capa como un capullo y si ustedes pueden um, apreciar acá podemos ver como este capullo está cubriendo la flor y una vez que la flor está lista va a botar este capullo y se va a abrir la flor Otra observación que podemos hacer es que una vez que la flor muere, se cae, este es un ejemplo, empieza a crecer la semilla. Y la semilla crece de una forma como un fruto que tiene la forma de una cápsula. Dentro de esta cápsula hay alrededor de 200 semillas, entonces se puede reproducir muy fácilmente. Otra observación que podemos hacer ahora, la luz está cerca, del, de esta, está directa en las flores y están todas abiertas. Estas son flores nuevas que acaban de brotar este capullo y se están abriendo. Pero una observación que también podemos hacer es que cuando los días son nublados o de noche, las flores se van a cerrar completamente como esta. También otra característica de la amapola de California es que también se puede encontrar en otros lugares del mundo. Y uno de ellos es Chile, en donde se le conoce como el dedal de oro, 
por la forma y el color o también como la flor del ferrocarril porque crece cerca de las líneas del tren um, me recuerda entonces mucho a mi país, Chile y hemos hecho ciertas observaciones que podemos hacer en nuestras casas espero que les guste y gracias, adiós I think Ari had no reason to be nervous at all. <laughs> um, and I can honestly say, I don't think I've looked that closely at a California poppy, which I should be ashamed of because after all, it is our state flower. And thank you for nodding, Carrie. You're making me feel even worse about myself. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about this next video because I already introduced myself. This is actually one of my videos. <laughs> And um, I basically just wanted to, uh, um, it's part of a larger tour, so you hear me reference that, but I wanted to stop at one of what I think is the, one of the most interesting spots on the Osborne Preserve and share some interesting things that you otherwise uh, wouldn't necessarily know were there. I wanted to pause here because this is another one of those spots where people just walk right by and they have no idea that there's something really interesting here. So if you look over in that direction, you might see something that doesn't look, you know, very exciting. It basically looks like a brown box. But that brown box is evidence uh, of um, humans that lived here on the Osborne Preserve, what's now the Osborne Preserve, um, back in the 1800s. In fact, uh, that box dates from the late 1800s. That was confirmed for us uh, by um, archaeologists from Sonoma State's Anthropological Stud Study Center. Um, and that's called a spring box. Basically, there is a um, spring. Uh, the folks who lived here built a box around the spring so that the water level uh, kind of rose up, made it easier to protect the water um, you know, from, from having things fall in it, made it easier to gather because you could just you know, dip a bucket right in there. Um, and that has lasted all these years. Um, something else that's extraordinarily interesting about it, which we ourselves didn't even know until five or six years ago, is there's a very rare um, invertebrate animal living in that spring box. It's a crustacean, so a type of shrimp. It's quite small small, only about that big, um, but you can still, you can see it with the naked eye, so that's sometimes called a macroscopic invertebrate. Um, and, uh, you know, five or six years ago, um, Larry Serpa, who is famous for doing a, a very complete catalog of the aquatic invertebrates that live here on the Osborne Preserve, um, he was up here looking around and he found um, a creature called Syncarus pacifica, sometimes called the California freshwater shrimp, which at the time was known from only six places in the entire world, all of them from the Bay Area. No one knew this incredibly rare animal was here. Um, since then, uh, it's been discovered in uh, a total of 17 uh, places, but again, all in the Bay Area, so this is a very, very, very rare animal. Um, now, you might wonder, well, why did it, you know, just how, how in the world do these animals, you know, reproduce if they're living in these small little areas? And it's actually believed that they travel um, through the groundwater and then come up in springs and come up in streams um, where they can then hopefully, you know, uh, maintain a population. So either that animal wasn't here and it just showed up and then we found it, or it's been here the whole time and we didn't know it was there. Either way, it, it was an incredibly interesting discovery. Um, and uh, again, a lot of people walk right by here. They don't even see the spring box. Uh, so they, do, you know, they don't even see uh, this really interesting piece of history. And even if they do, they have no idea that there's this incredible rare animal that's living here on the Osborne Preserve that we didn't even know existed here um, until five or six years ago. So, yes, I, I just lo I love that information. It was so exciting when Larry Serpa found Sinkara's Pacifica. And anyway, I, I just got really excited about it. But I cannot end this on myself. So, um, we are going to actually end with another video uh, from Nicolette. 
And uh, the reason that I'm opening um, uh, what you might see now as a PowerPoint slide is because um, Nicolette actually references um, basically a, she, she references uh, a couple things that it's a little hard to see in the video just because there's a limit to how much you can zoom. So she talks about basically the wings that lady but that ladybugs or ladybird beetles have the the um the uh and this i think is a good picture to kind of show you what she's talking about and she also talks about the larvae and this is what ladybug larvae look like a lot of people don't realize they look so different from the adults um and i just wanted to show that to you before we start on the video uh but one of the things i like about this video is uh that our students are able to synthesize, you know, they take what they learn in the naturalist or the land management program and they synthesize with what they learn in classes uh, and are able to share like wonderful things with our visitors to the preserve. And so this is uh, Nicolette sharing uh, some wonderful information about uh, ladybugs. Hello, my name is Nicolette Michael. I am a student at Sonoma State University studying biology. I also work for the Center for Environmental Inquiry um, as, the, um, as an um, outreach assistant. Um, and today I want to talk to you all about ladybugs because I found some ladybugs in my garden here. Um, ladybugs are actually beetles because um, they're from the order of Coleoptera and they have, they're different than true bugs because they have um, different um, like wings. Um, beetles have those sheath wings on top of them and the membranous wings below. If you ever see ladybug fly, they have those like two wings up here and then they have those big wings that are like flying that way. So that's a, a way you can tell that they're beetles. Um, I have a beetle a larvae right here. Um, I'm gonna show you all, I'm gonna figure that out. Okay, here is a ladybug larvae. Um, you can tell that it's a, a um, it's a ladybug larvae because of its coloration. So it has like the black um, body and um, like four red, uh, red spots. Um, you can tell that it's a larvae uh, by the way that its body is shaped. There's three different types of, of like larvae. There's, you know, caterpillars that, you know, don't, they, they have like those, they do have six legs. They also have the pro legs that help them inch along. And then there's the, you know, maggot types like, the ones that don't have any legs. And then there's these, which do have legs. I saw earlier today that it was molting. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but it was encased in this um, exoskeleton, um, which it does throughout its um, larval life from an egg um, through the, the, the different sizes of larvae. This is a very small larvae. There's some bigger ones over there. Um, but yeah, so it, it will molt a few times, um, you know, by um, sort of shedding its uh, its exoskeleton and create an, a new one, and then eventually it will have its you know last molting where it will um, pupate or create you know another type of cocoon that um, and then it will emerge as an adult. Yeah, so you don't see a lot of these these little ones here. Let me see if I can find another one. Let's venture over here. Let's see. Oh, here's a bigger, oh. Here's a bigger one. See that one? Oh, it's tiny, but it's very fast. So, um, both, you know, the, the larvae and adults have that same, like, coloration um, because both of them have a toxin that they can exude um, if they are, you know, in danger. They have a toxin that they, they you know, release from the the, knee, the joints of their knees um, to tell them that to tell the predators that they are dangerous. Ladybugs are really good for your garden because and they're beneficial insects because they will eat aphids from your plants from plants because that's their main food source and they eat other um, other harmful insects um, yeah they're good um, a big one. I wonder if there's any adults around here. Maybe not. Where are you going, buddy? Okay. Here, here I found 
a species of ladybug. Um, I was just holding it, but it flew away from me, which is okay. But um, let's see. If you can see, um, it has those seven um, spots, which is indicative of the um, Crescinella septum septum punctata. Sorry. Um, I, think I remember it by the septum is like seven, and then punctata, like little, um, little dots. Um, so, this is a species that um, was introduced to um, North America in the 1970s. Um, I think because of the, um, either the, the uh, decrease of um, native ladybug species, um, so they brought um, this one in as well as another species um, to help um, with their bi you know biological control, baiting some of the aphids and stuff. Um, yeah, this one. So as I, I said before, the, there are different species of, of ladybug, um, and that is based on um, the number of um, spots on their bodies, so that the spots does not indicate their age. Actually, different species, which is pretty cool. Um, and since I saw some of the other larvae here, I wonder if those larvae were also this species. It's hard to tell when they're larvae, but as adults, definitely easier. So this one's just this one's just turning around. I'm surprised I found this one here, but it's sort of cool. A lot of the um, adult ladybug species will, you know, um, lay their eggs in a place that definitely has um, food because they, you know, need to guarantee the food for the larvae because they can't really go anywhere. You know, they can't, they're very small and they don't have wings, but this one has wings. So, going around. Um, so, the, since the adults have wings, they can you know, definitely move farther um, and can find um, find aphids um, from farther away, which is pretty nice. Yeah, and I really like these, you know, ladybugs because, you know, the it's amazing how um, such animals can, like, um, I, or I, I'm very amazed by, um, you know, um, insects going from a larval to an adult stage. The pupating is really amazing and it's very, yeah, it's very cool. And, you know, the, um, the ladybug larvae look really different from, from the adults. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to, to show people how different they look and how, you know, the larvae are still, you know, safe. They're not different, you know, species. They're just larvae. And make sure no one harms the larvae because um, they're beneficial. So, yeah, so I'm just hanging out. So I'll probably leave it alone. Thank you very much. So, yes, a big round of applause to all of our um, all of our videographers. Um, and I don't want to take too time too much time out um, uh, too much extra time because I know folks might have questions. And of course, we have Nicolette, Ari, and Peter here. If you want to ask them anything directly or me about any of our programs or any of the videos. Um, but uh, I can honestly say that um, I knew a lot of things about ladybugs, but not that they had poisonous knees, specifically knees. So. <laughs> Well, I guess I'm going to end myself here and just say, I am so happy that we were able to see those diverse perspectives, all from these people that have really had a chance to engage with our programs and land. And I'm just so thankful to Suzanne for hosting this, putting those all together. It was harder technically than you imagine. And then for all of the students and volunteers that helped, because this is just a sampling of the videos. So we're, we actually have a lot more that we're going to be able to post. Um, so I hope everybody can tell their friends and family um, to come see these because that's one nice thing about virtual events is you don't have to be local. We, you know, we still focus on North Bay challenges, but the world is is clearly very connected. So please let everybody know about these. Um, and I will just say a couple things before I turn it over. Um, we had over two dozen events this spring. <laughs> um, so I really encourage everyone to go on our calendar 
on our past events page and just take a look at all the recordings. Um, we have every other one posted now. So this is the last one that we still need to, to post. Um, and we are already starting on fall programming. So we'll be doing some similar things next fall. Um, and in that regard, this is something that we really encourage the community to be involved in. So if you have an idea of a topic, if you have a presenter you know who might want to get the word out, or if you're one of those people that might want to get the word out, let us know, email me, and we can have a, a fun conversation. And these things are really flexible. So we have these Learn with a Naturalist events, some we are calling deep dives, which are much more like lectures. We have um, local nature events where you actually spend part of the time in your own backyard or right around the corner engaging in nature in some way, and then coming back on Zoom. And we really hope to bring this into future events even once the preserves are open, um, somehow bringing in this digital environment. So. I wanna thank you all, not just the people here at this event, but everybody who attended all the events this spring uh, and really were part of this new exploration for us. Um, we really want your feedback. <laughs> um, here's a reminder to everyone who saw the previous events that where materials were created. We'd love to get those materials into our anthology of works that are being created by people with these events. Um, and thank you all for staying safe and staying connected to nature and staying connected to each other and to the center. So thank you all so very much. Uh, and with that, I think it's just time for any questions or comments that people have about these videos or about any of the programs Suzanne was talking about. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually unmute everybody. So if there's a strange noise in the background, just go ahead and mute yourself again. <laughs> um. Can I say, Carrie, it looks like Sarah Reed um, mentioned in the chat that she has a question. So, um, and I got Sarah, lots. It's what, oh, and, and, and Ned, I think, said he had lots of questions. But um, uh, uh, since I happened to see Sarah's comment first, um, Sarah, wonderful to see you. And what is your question? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to echo what Carrie just said. I love the variety of all of these videos. Thank you all so much for doing them um, because they were all such a great examples and different in every way of um, how we can present nature to people and make it interesting. So thank you for all of your perspectives. Um, I want to especially thank um, Ari. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yes. Um, love the California poppy one. I don't understand much Spanish, but I could totally follow what you were saying. Um, because of your expressions and because of what you were doing with your hands, that was a fantastic video. You should be very proud of it. Um, I love that you showed all the different aspects of the poppy plant and explained about it. Um, I have a question for Suzanne about the freshwater shrimp. Is that what it's called, California freshwater shrimp? Yes, the uh, scientific name is Syncarus pacifica, um, which I, I prefer to the to the common name um, for this species because um, California freshwater shrimp sounds somewhat non-distinct, you know, non-distinct. Um, and so Syncarus pacifica, yes. So um, I'm curious if I've actually found some before. So I want to connect with mm -hmm. you, hopefully via email, with a photo and we see if we can identify it because it would be interesting to find out if it is a different location that isn't previously recorded and where it is because I know exactly where it was because it was in a California naturalist class. Um, I also want to thank um, Nicolette for the ladybug one because that's something a lot of people don't realize about the differences of the larva to the full ladybug. And I learned quite a bit from that video. Thank you. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you, everybody, for producing this. Thank you, Sarah. Um, care, oh, I, I see Ned. Ned raised his hand. So Well, as, I, I as actually have had some questions that came up from three of the different videos, but I don't want to hog the, the available time. Um, Go for it, please. But, I'll yeah. just dive. but, but first, uh, I'd like to start off um, by echoing Sarah's comments. And like, this is actually really good for me because I'm, I was just new with just this last class in the spring as along with Ari. And, um, and so I'm still very much in learning mode and just trying to, to figure out 
ways to present stuff like because like okay how i want to i want to i want to be able to lead really good talks for kids and for adults eventually and so everything seeing here has actually been enormously helpful just from that example um and just an area that was a great video it's great to hear you speaking spanish i just have to say i really <laughs> um, i sound smarter <laughs> yeah um, well well, the words flow differently. We'll say that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but it's very, it was just lovely. And um, so one thing I was trying to listen along and I, I liked the explanation of the whole life cycle and was kind of wishing that some of that was in English. Um, and, uh, but was it true? Did you say that they're also called railroad flowers? Or Rail, railroad? Yeah. They, yeah. Okay. The track, and, yeah. And so do people consider them invasive flowers in Chile and try to eradicate them or is it more benign? No, because they grow where the, the area has been disturbed already. So the native plants have been already taken away by you know, roads or, or tra train tracks or something like yeah. that. And then that's where it comes out and it's beautiful. Then, well, Technically, yes, they are non-native and they could be invasive, but from my point of view that I grew up, you know, seeing this on the way to the beach or to the mountain or anywhere where by the road, it's something that it's, you know, in my retina. It's, yeah. 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 Nice. I guess that, that sort of tie, the invasives ties in with actually the questions I had um, about for, for Nicolette, when you were talking about the, the, uh, the, the ladybird beetles or the ladybugs. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned that the seven spot lady beetles, which I've been, I've been like going nuts with iNaturalist. And so I've been like picking out the different ones in just in my own garden. And I know it's, it's like they, all these seem to be introduced species. Okay. And so are some of them you said it was purposefully introduced in the 70s to for to for biological control does that mean that it's still something that's encouraged are there bad lady beetles versus good ladybugs you know yeah, did you um, uh, did you hear my question <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But, um yeah so um from what i understand um in one of an entomology class we talked about you know how introducing some insect species can be detrimental, but um, from what um, we talked about, ladybugs didn't, uh, don't seem to have um, a lot of um, problems. You know, they don't, go, they don't go after, you know, other insects. They mostly target aphids and some other um, invasive um, insects. So they don't really, I, from, my, from what I understand, they don't have a lot of um, problems. They're probably one of the the, um, the more the the, um, the safer um, biological con controls when it comes to insects. I think. I remember hearing things about Japanese. Oh, <laughs> see that, Sarah? <laughs> about Japanese um, lady, you know, j some Japanese lady. But this was maybe 20, 30 years ago. I don't know that people were, spoke of like it was a bad thing. Um, that may have been in the Midwest. Is that? Um, can I say something? Uh, so there, I'm, I'm just reading that there is an Asian um, beetle that has a parasite that doesn't affect it, but does affect other native species. So that may oh. be what you were hearing about. That, okay. Okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah, so I don't need to worry because I found ones that, you know, that the iNaturalist marked as invasive. And then I was sitting there and it's like, well, I've got this larvae in my hand. It's an invasive species. Do I squish it? You know, and it just trying to make that, that, that decision right there. Um, I did squish it. Um, I, I probably shouldn't have, but uh, based on what I just learned. But anyway, um, and, uh, that's a really important question that a lot of people don't consider. So thanks for, you know, and there's so much research out there now just publicly available. So I bet you if you went to, I mean, I'm sure there, there's like yeah. Cal Gipsy for plants, right? For the Invasive Plant Council. I'm sure there's something like that that you could see. Maybe Bug Guide has some information on that. I'll um, take a look. Specific. And since Nicolette taught us that you can 
you can identify based on the number of spots, that's a pretty easy ID, right? You don't have to worry that you're getting it wrong um, once you know what you're looking for. Yeah, well, I, there just, are. I just got some today and they're convergent ladybugs. So these, this is what the nurseries are selling. Um, and it's, um, try to read this, Hippodamia convergens. So um, that's what um, the nurseries are selling as ladybugs to introduce in our gardens. I got it for aphid control and I've grown them in my yard before where with enough, um, I almost said fuel because I'm so into um, plants and the wildfire stuff, um, yeah. with enough food source, I've had them reproduce year after year in my front yard. Oh, wow. um, so it's a really fun thing to, um, to introduce as a great species. And that's not to say I had an unhealthy yard. I had enough variety of plants that supported the kinds of things that the ladybugs needed, and especially water. And it, it's just a really fun thing because I didn't know what the larva were either until I thought, oh my gosh, what is this scale stuff on my plants? Yeah. And it's really and, fun. And Sarah, that's really fascinating. Did you do, like, how did you choose which ladybird beetles to buy for your garden? Was it just what the store recommended or did you have some other way of figuring that out? Well, originally it was what either Friedman's or King's Nursery had in stock and I just bought ladybugs. Uh -huh. But I just, just hearing Nicolette's video here, I thought, I wonder what kinds these are that I picked up this morning. Mm -hmm. So um, here we go. They're, they're going to become part of um, the junior college neighborhood tonight. <laughs> they may appear in your yard if you've got enough to eat and my yard doesn't. So <laughs> I'm so glad they've been able to to persist and become part of your ecosystem, it seems, in a healthy way. That's great. Yeah, fun. I know we lost Suzanne for a minute, but I think she might be back. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can you see me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, good. Um, and I was, I was still available by phone, just my video for some reason went out. Um, and I'm back, but, I'm, but I was always there on the phone and I'm back <laughs> on video too. So, <laughs> sorry about that. That had nothing to do with your questions. I wasn't like, I didn't leave in a huff because <laughs> you were offended. offended by your questions or anything. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ned, did you get to all of your questions? I have another one, but Ari might have a question. I don't want to interrupt. Oh, no, mine is uh, just a comment. So no. go, go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, because it was about the yellow star thistles. So I guess, is it Peter, I think is, uh, uh, I actually took notes. Yes. Um, okay. So. Um, when is the right time to mow? That was K. Well, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, and we've been, uh, discussing that, uh, for a few weeks now. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, before, uh, the lead person on this right now is a, is a guy named Benjamin Bravo. Um, he's studying it very closely for the center. Um, but he suggested, or based on his research that you should cut it right as it's producing its flowers because um, it will have invested enough energy um, to produce that, that flower. And so by cutting it back, then it, it won't necessarily uh, put in the energy to flower again and then go to seed. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking there is kind of you're, you're having it invest enough, but not um, enough for it to, to spread. So right. that's kind of the thinking there. Is that pretty much the only way that they figured out how to, uh, you know, how to actually eradicate it? I guess <laughs> I would say, yeah, I mean, Suzanne, I don't know if you want to jump in, but I guess I, I would say that it's yeah. kind of a I, yeah. more comprehensive management uh, technique. Right. Yeah, so. I am. Um, uh, uh, Sarah, go ahead, because I know you've had a lot of experience with this, too, and I'll, I'll be happy to add anything. <laughs> okay, it's kind of a little story. I w um, did volunteer patrol in Annadale for years, and one day when we were coming down Spring Creek Trail, I looked ahead and saw this man bending over and picking things, and I thought, okay, we got to put our, um, our na na naturalist hat on, our, like, oh, are you picking flowers kind of thing, and th so we came up to him, and I said, hey, how you doing? What you, what you picking? And he said, oh, this yellow star thistle, it's just horrible. So this is a small meadow. This guy had been pulling it out by the roots, barehanded, 
he completely eradicated that star thistle and that was like 20 years ago and i have not seen a sprig of it come back he pulled all of that out and that was the way we got that out of that particular meadow Wow. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much the only way to do it. Now, what I've understood is that you can pull it and leave it because it will wilt and it won't go to bulb. But one of the keys is to catch it before it produces the flower and the spiky, thorny thing, which is called the bolt stage, because that's where it's going to produce seeds. So um, I've also participated in a project out of Spring Lake on Canyon Fire Road, where we went out just before it went to bolt, which is easier to pull because it doesn't stick you through your leather gloves. And we actually hand pulled it. And that eliminated some of that area as well. That said, it spreads like a weed. <laughs> and it's it's really, really awful. The other thing to know about it is that in large quantities, it's horribly toxic to livestock and horses who usually leave it alone even before bolt stage because I think it doesn't just it doesn't taste good. But then once it goes into a bowl, it's just so darn prickly. So that's my and then if, of course burning it. If you can do a control burn before it goes to bolt, that's that's probably one of the most awesome things too. Wow. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah. I, I was going to mention um, that, um, yeah, that, um, Sarah, it sounds like you have more experience with that than you wish you had. Yes. And Peter, <laughs> is, Peter is getting much more familiar with it than he ever wishes that he, he did now <laughs> up at the Osborne Preserve. But absolutely. So what Sarah's talking about, the, the hand pulling, you generally do that before you would string trim. So actually what Ben is doing at the preserve right now is hand pulling it because it's too early in its phenology for it to be effectively treated via string trimming at the Osborne Preserve right now. Um, so it just depends on what the plant is doing. Because as Peter mentioned, as Sarah mentioned, you actually want to pull it up before it starts flowering with when Peter said with uh, as Peter said you want to get it just as it's flowering to string trim it um uh there's anecdotal evidence though I don't think any any um research has been done on this that actually a very late string trim after it's seeded after it's flowered um can have beneficial effects because essentially you knock down all the dead material and you essentially make a mulch apparently the um the seeds are very uh, resistant to, or, or rather, they're very um, unlikely to germinate if there's any shade at all. In fact, what Ben and Peter and Kyle are doing, or uh, sorry, Ben and Peter and Sophia are doing, it, our, our new steward, is um, pulling it up and essentially putting it in the shade because um, instead of having to pack it all back out because it's not likely to germinate in the shade. So. I'm very curious about this whole anecdotal make a mulch thing because there have been some places around the Osborne Preserve which just for, for fire purposes we've done a very late late mow like in the in the very late summer or the or the fall and I've noticed that yellow star thistle seems to be going down in those areas so it makes me curious mm -hmm. um, you can graze with goats but goats are expensive and hard to keep in one place um, <laughs> and I know with fire <laughs> I know with fire, you also have to time it very, very uh, carefully. Um, and if you get any, if there's any um, moisture after your your prescribed burn, it's likely to um, you're you're likely to still get more. So uh, it's it's tricky. Uh, and like Sarah said, it's just it just spreads so so easily. It's going to take years and years, as Kyle mentioned, just years of of continual treatment. There have actually been crazy treatments done at the Osborne Preserve, including the release of a weevil, very specifically for biological control to eat it. But then there was no follow up and we have as much yellow star thistle or more than we ever had. So it's just a matter of continuing and keeping records like, okay, we did this and we did this here and this is what happened and now we're doing this and so. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully something will they'll figure out. Yeah, that's huh. interesting. Thank you. I have 
one more comment, maybe this will help Ned um, and the new students as well, um, on Nicolette's original video about um, doing the, basically the sit spot from indoors. Um, one of the things that I like to uh, encourage is to ask your audience to answer those questions. Um, so like if you've got a group of students, especially kids, engage them in answering those questions. And it's just pretty darn amazing to see the kids come out and the adults too. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. I want to know why Suzanne's sitting in her car. Does <laughs> <laughs> that come up in, in all of these? Yeah. I know. Uh... I, well, it's, it's the only place I can get an internet signal. <laughs> I mean, I, I have, I have some internet at the, at the uh, preserve where I live, um, but it's satellite. And so um, it just doesn't work well enough for video. It doesn't work consistently enough for video. So. Um. I think it's just a perfect example at the, of the lengths that Suzanne goes to without <laughs> anyone knowing. <laughs> what all the work is behind the scenes. She just shows up and we're like, why is she in a car? And there's a full backstory of so much effort and time put into trying other options. And this is what worked. And I mean, she literally was going to hold her phone under the, the computer with the special speaker, turn it on and off speaker mode at certain times, organize all the videos. And the whole time she's just like this, <laughs> don't even know what's going on, right? And I came I came indoors so it wouldn't be quite so distracting for everybody else to see what was going on behind me out in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we would have enjoyed seeing what was in your art yard, Sarah. Would we have seen your horses? No, no. I live in the junior college district, but we were so distracted right now by a pair of hooded orioles and two different species of hummingbirds who are in our yard constantly from dawn until dark. And they have a lot to say about it. <laughs> so it's pretty. It's well, that pretty reminds me of something I was going to comment on about all the videos is just how much background activity there was. I don't know if other people noticed that, but especially in John's video, the very beginning, Jurassic John, there were so many birds. And then I kept noticing it for the silent hike. It was really great to hear the dichotomy between the footsteps and then uh -huh. what was naturally happening. And also that I noticed the footsteps, but when I'm on a silent hike, I don't, cause I'm the one creating them. And it just was this, this interesting, it called attention to when I do something, it, it becomes subconscious, but everything else around me was noticing, I'm sure would notice those footsteps in a very big way. So it made, made me realize like our impact also. Um, I, I really enjoyed all the, the audio to, to these videos in the background. Lots of orange crowned warblers back there. <laughs> That's what I heard. Great, guys. Well, you're the, the troopers that stuck around another 20 minutes. Do <laughs> you have any other questions or comments for, for anybody? No. Ari. I have one. Um, I like the, the video of the silent walk. I did it with, um, was with Patty, Porcupine Patty, and it was a group of boys. And um, Patty had this the great idea to do it while they were just walking down and then a curve and then up so they couldn't see each other. There were just blind spots. And I, I went first and I was waiting in this shady area, area where they couldn't see me either. So they walk in and they were like, oh, wow, that was amazing. Oh, wow, I love it. Oh, wow, I, I felt like I was going into the zombie attack or something like that, <laughs> some kind of movie or something. And they, and they were so happy to have done it. I saw the boys were like, yeah, I did it. And I've never walked alone before, like what you say, Suzanne. And <gasps> yeah, it was really like, wow, these, these kids are different now. <laughs> yeah, transformative. Oh. Truly. It was, it was. And just the spark on their eyes and just how they were like, yeah, you did it. Yeah, I was there. Oh yeah, I was afraid, but no, I keep walking. Yeah. That's fantastic. It reminds me of meeting a land pads group up on Taylor Mountain one day that were probably, probably third graders and they had quite a group of them and they'd gone all the way up that steep elevation of Taylor Mountain and the kids were getting tired and they had stopped and talked about feeling your heartbeat and feeling that you're breathing harder and being aware of nature and stuff. But when they got almost to the top, and if any of you know it, it's where the, um, the broken down um, stone fence line is just before you get to the top. They had all the kids stop and go silent 
and close their eyes. They put their hand on the person's shoulder in front of them and closed their eyes. And the leader led them like a, like a, a snake up to the top, complete silence and completely um, blind basically to have the kids experience that. And it also completely shut down the, oh, I'm so tired. Are we almost there kind of thing? And all of a sudden, okay, you can open your eyes. And they were at the top and they were just like, wow, this is cool. And it just totally changed the energy. And it gave them that silent exposure of listening and feeling with their feet and trusting the people in front and behind them. It was so awesome. I loved that. And then the, oh, wow, was just, that was just terrific. I think that that probably got them all the way back down the mountain after they had their snack up there. It was just so powerful. I loved it. Nicolette, do you have anything you want to say about the activity that is very similar that we do as a naturalist? I, yeah, I guess there's a similar type of hike like that um, that we do where we, um, the one that, um, so we um, have kids line up um, and we, everyone has a blindfold um, and they're, you know, similar thing where they're um, holding onto the person in front of them and um, and you know they they walk for a little bit and yeah at the at the end you know they it, it feels like uh, uh going from you know just you're, you're somewhere in the wilderness and then you go somewhere else and it's just really cool to to see how uh, it's everything to see like how how far you think you go when you are blindfolded but you really don't go that far but yeah it's, yeah it's a really cool it's a really cool way to experience things. I think, I don't know, I think, like, I rely a lot on my eyes to see and experience so many things. So when you're forced to to view things in other ways, like with your ears and just, you, you know, um, being in sort of a, um, not so much in fear, but in like you, without a sense, it feels different. I don't know. So, um, so it sort of heightens the other sense, and not heightens, but yeah, I think that's that's one that yeah, it's pretty similar to the other one. Yeah. Any other naturalists want to comment on that? Oh, Anna oh. has something. Let me let me unmute Anna really quick. Anna, did you see that request to unmute you? I think you have to click a button on your screen. There you go. Oh, I can't hear you though for some reason. Say that again, Anna. We can't hear you. We can't hear what you're saying, and I'm so sorry. Oh, I see you waving. Can you, do you want to type in the chat? Um, uh, I think okay. she was saying goodbye. Oh, oh, she, maybe, oh, she's saying goodbye. several other events, so it was um, really nice to see her here. Um, okay. And she was just signing off. But I guess I had a question, Suzanne. Do you think? Oh, wait, wait, I, I sorry. I, I wanted to just very quickly follow up on, on what you said. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, okay. Well, then, <laughs> then you go first. <laughs> it was just about wondering if the, the group Sarah was leading was actually looking into the same valley that our naturalists would be looking into at each other. Um, from Taylor Mountain? From Taylor Mountain? That's what I'm wondering, because yes. I, I think we might be looking our, at... Our, um... Uh, the when when um, our naturalists do that activity, Sarah, they're on top or they're at the highest point uh, on the preserve on Sonoma Mountain. Mm -hmm. And if you look, I you you I, you can look. I believe you can look at Taylor Mountain. You get a good view of Taylor Mountain. Um, so from Taylor Mountain, can you look right back at Sonoma Mountain, Sarah? Um, somewhat. It's kind of difficult because of the vineyards up there now, but mostly the view is from looking out like directly west. In fact, I've even seen the glint of the sun on the ocean through a, um, one of the um, valleys out in the coastal hills. And then you have um, a pretty big expanse all the way around to um, 
Bennett Mountain, you can kind of see Sonoma Mountain, but it's more of the east slope um, and above where North Sonoma Mountain Regional Park is. So I think the preserve is kind of a little bit south of there and kind of down a little bit on the mountain. So um, from Taylor Mountain, you do get a pretty good view of Bennett Valley, but then you can see all the way north to Snow Mountain and um, Cobb Mountain, Mount St. Helena to the north. So it's really expansive. So if you haven't been up there, I highly recommend it, but not on a hot day because it's really exposed. But um, And it is a climb. It's 1,100 feet. Um, but it, it's amazing to be able to get the layout in your mind of, of why it takes like almost an hour to go from Sonoma State University over to like Oakmont. I mean, it's, or like, you know, East Highway 12. It's, there's a lot of space we have to travel through. And when you see that geologically, it's, it's or geographically, it's, it's pretty <laughs> surprising. So, um, so I'd say that at the preserve, you're probably looking more down over Sonoma Valley and maybe, um, I don't know, down over like Sonoma Mountain Road where it's um, the, south, the south Sonoma Mountain Road, no? No, we're we're north of there. Um, we look we look at we get a very good view of Bennett Peak. We get a wonderful view of Mount St. Helena and the valley and the north end of the Valley of okay. the Moon. And on a clear day, actually, we we can see the ocean as well. Um, so really, the, our our view is only blocked by the highest point of Sonoma Mountain, which would be if you're if you're looking north toward Mount St. Helena. Right. That would basically be behind and to your right. Um, so we, we just, yeah, it's, it's a really nice view. So actually, if, if Sarah, if you want to, to have a, a guided tour of the Osborne Preserve, I'll, oh, actually, any, any one of our naturalists, I'm sure, would be happy to, to bring you up there, and so would I. So <laughs> I'd love to. I think it's honestly been since just um, like the maybe early 80s since I was up there. So that's there, wow. was, there wasn't anything established when we went for an outing out there on the on the preserve. So it's been a very, very long time. <laughs> Come back. Yes, I'd love to. Yes. Yes, please. Suzanne, you were going to comment on Nicolette's comment. Oh, I was <laughs> I feel like we kind of moved on now. Um I was just gonna ask. So we make our students do the blindfold ridge walk. As part of their training, they have to put blindfolds on and do the blindfold ridge walk. We don't give them an option. Um, the, I'm curious about the, our community member naturalists. I know you get a choice. Ari and Ned, did you, were, did you actually choose to put the blindfold on and do the ridge walk? Um, Ari did, he's nodding. I'm, 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 I know that I did a blindfold walk, but I don't know if it was necessarily on the ridge. It's what ridge are you talking is? Well, just you, you end up, you end up at the highest point with the students, at least you end up at the highest point on Sonoma mountain. Oh, um, well, what we did was we went up to the crest there, you know, where it's really muddy, you know, at the, yeah. when you're climbing up from the pond uh -huh. yeah, up there. Um, so yeah. So that's the, the highest point is actually, if you're looking north where the, uh, where that, you know, the, the high power lines or whatever they are cut through would uh -huh. be behind you and to you. Yeah. Yes, but I'm, I'm sorry. I meant to say not the highest point on Sonoma Mountain, the highest point on the Osborne Preserve. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that's going to be a little disorienting up there. Yeah. <laughs> or at least a trail, right? Because I think. You can take mm -hmm. a little bit further, but it's not actually on the trail. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that you both chose to do that. Yes. Both trust, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, everybody. Well, don't be shy. This is your, this is your last call for questions or comments. Um, I'll see you all next fall. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, guys, I can't believe we're saying goodbye. I'm going to miss miss these events for a few months here. So I hope to see all your beautiful faces then. And I hope maybe some of you can even maybe contribute to some. Uh, just let me know if you'd be interested. And again, I really, I really do want the, the public's feedback on how this went, how any of them went, and how we can do things in the future. So um, mm -hmm. 
You're our people. And I hope you feel like it. Thank you. I. I want to add one more thing, which is um, we will also be uh, um, doing a digital uh, naturalist program this fall. So experienced folks, I will be reaching out to you and badgering you and um, stalking you at your house from a distance. But um, but we'll we'll be in touch about that too. And I have not forgotten that we are continuing to do our Zoom socials for our uh, naturalists and land management students, just not as frequently as we were during the season. So keep your eye out. I will be sending emails out about that. That is a really good point. Really, the center has pivoted. We have not canceled things. So anything that you would normally do with us or get from us or give to us, just reach out. It's, it might be different, but it's not gone. <laughs> Thank you so much. And know that some of us community members out here, even though we're not actually involved with college campuses, realize how much work this is. I mean, it's, it's uh, kudos to anybody who's prepping for more than one class. I don't know how they're doing it. Um, and I just, want to say we really appreciate what you all are doing as students and as instructors because it's the whole new way of doing things. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. I so appreciate it. One more. Goodbye. And we'll see you in nature soon.